Okay, shalom. And um, this week's lecture, it's uh, called The Gift of Spirituality, Embracing the True Torah Life. And um, as you know, we always start with a practical modern day issue. And the modern day issue that we're going to talk about today is, let's take a deeper view into what Torah is all about. And what is spirituality all about? We hear a lot about spirituality, a spiritual way of living. Um, what is that all about from a Jewish perspective? Perspective. Okay, so uh, that's why I wanted to go to what is Torah all about. Um, Torah for many is seen as the constitution of the Jewish religion. In other words, Torah is seen as a religion filled with obligations and prohibitions which ultimately govern whether the individual is going to heaven or the opposite. Now, however, in Hasidic teachings, this is not what the Torah is all about. Rather, the Torah is God's ultimate gift to the Jewish people. Now, what I'm trying to do here is differentiate whether we look at Torah as a religion or Torah as spirituality and spirituality and religion, as we're going to see, is not always one and the same. So what is the gift that Torah is that God gave it to us? It's his ultimate gift, he calls it. Now, the gift behind this gift is that the Torah offers us a connection and a relationship with God. And thus our sages teach us on the verse, Magid Dvarav Yaakov, he tells his words to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. And the question is why the emphasis on his? And our sages tell us, the Holy One, blessed be he. What he does, he tells Israel to do and to heed. Thus, Torah is the wisdom and the will of God through which God behaves and creates and relates to his universe. And thus, Torah is the bridge through which we become one with God in our intellect, in our emotions, thoughts, speech, and actions, which leads us into the topic of spirituality. Spirituality ultimately is a binary code. Binary code means there's only two choices. Now, the binary code is simple. One, God. Two, ego. It's one of those two. Like the computer works on ones and zeros, that's how spirituality works. Ones and, ones and zeros. God or ego. Now, I want to say, before I go any further, that even though spirituality is a binary code, let us not confuse binary code with black and white thinking. In other words, when we talk about the binary code of it being about God or about my ego, there is an infinite spectrum in the ratio of God or ego. In other words, my intentions in when I do something could be 100% ego and zero God. It could be 50% about God, but I also got my personal interest, my ego involved here. So there is an infinite amount in the ratio of the binary code between how much is it about God and how much is it about me. So it's not black and white. However, it is binary. Ultimately speaking, that is the definition of spirituality. Am I, is my life, is my action, is my specific, what I'm doing right now, is it about God or is it about my ego? And even if it is about God and my ego, how much ratio is driven by my ego, and how much is it by my service and transparency 
and obedience and submissiveness to God. Okay. Now, to embrace this is to accept our humanity and the journey of growth that we are meant to embrace. As they say, poco poco, little by slowly, I give a little bit more of my intention to God, a little less of my ego. Now, this lecture is going to explore the spirituality of Torah in levels upon levels. And the modern day issue of this lecture will then answer how we embrace this on a practical level. Okay? I always share with you where I take the lectures from. This lecture is based primarily on a mimer, a mystical teaching that the Rebbe of Blessed and Saintly Memory delivered on this Shabbat in 1969. I was just two years old. Exploring the mystical teachings of the Jews arriving at Mount Sinai on Rosh Chodesh, the first day of the Jewish calendar month of Sivan. Okay, introduction. The reason why we are discussing this topic today is because this Shabbat is called Shabbat Mevarachim. The Shabbat before the beginning of a new month, Rosh Chodesh, is called the Shabbat of Blessing because we make a special prayer in blessing the upcoming month, announcing the day of Rosh Chodesh. What day of the week will it be? Not only that, but in this year, this Shabbat Bamidbar is actually Erev Rosh Chodesh. It's the eve before Rosh Chodesh. This Shabbat is a 29th of the Hebrew calendar month called Iyar, and the next day is the first day, Rosh Chodesh, the new moon of the month called Sivan. Now, as we will see, there is always a special connection between the Rosh Chodesh, new moon, and the Jewish people, as we are taught by our sages that the Jewish people are likened and we count by the moon. And there's a beautiful teaching in the Medrash how Jacob is compared to the moon and thus all his offspring is compared to the moon. And we count our calendar, our year, works on the lunar cycle, not on the solar cycle. Okay? Nevertheless, there is a unique and special connection between this Rosh Chodesh coming up, which is Rosh Chodesh Sivan, Rosh Chodesh of the third month. When I say third month, I mean from the month of Passover, but it's not the third month from Rosh Hashanah, which was back in September time. Okay, now, let's see what the special connection is with this Rosh Chodesh. So the verse begins the story of the Jewish people receiving the Torah from God with, and in the third month, month of Sivan, this month, of the children of Israel's departure from Egypt, on this day they arrived in the desert of Sinai, which literally means that this is the day from when we left Egypt on the 15th day of Nisan. We traveled the whole story with the splitting of the sea and everything, 49 days until we received the Torah. Now, 45 days is when, uh, 44 days is when we reach at Mount Sinai. Now, the sages say that on this day, the verse doesn't say which day. It says in the third month on this day. What day of the month was it? So it said the Talmud tells us that this day is Rosh Chodesh. We arrived at Mount Sinai on the new moon of the third month, Rosh Chodesh. And how do they understand this? So to understand this, I need to quickly share with you that the Torah is expounded through 13 principles. And it's an introduction to the Sifra. We actually say it in our prayer every single day in the morning prayer. We say, and the house of Rabbi Shmuel, meaning the school of Rabbi Shmuel, taught us the 13 principles. They were handed down from Moses to Joshua to generation to generation. Now, principle number two is called Gzera Shava. Now, what does that mean? Let me read to you exactly what that means. What it means is that we establish, which is an analogy between two laws established on the basis of identical expression in the biblical text. You have here a word, you have there a word, this word is defined, this word is not defined. 
we connect it to and we carry the definition from this verse to that verse. Let's see how that works in our case. So I'm quoting to you the Talmud. Rava said, Rava, a great rabbi sage, everyone agrees that the Jews came to the Sinai desert on the new moon. Why? As it is written here, in the third month after the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, this day came this day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, it doesn't elaborate which day it was. However, now jump to another verse, and it is written there, this month shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, just as there, the term this is referred to the new moon, so to here, the term is referring to the new moon. So we take the word this day, we take the word this again, we say that word over there, this, is the first day of the month, the new moon, Rosh Chodesh. So to in this verse, when it doesn't explain itself, it just says this day, it's relying on us to know and extrapolate that he already explained to us what this day refers to. Okay, now, upon this piece of Talmud, comes along Tosfis, and I have a link in my notes, which I'll post soon, um, of what the uh, Tosfis, who Tosfis is. They were a bunch of sages, uh, uh, commentaries on the Talmud. A lot of them were the grandchildren of the famous Rashi, of Shlomo Yitzchaki. He asked the question. Now follow along with me. He asked, why does the Talmud use the principle of the Gzeira Shava on the word this? When in the Talmud, in a different tractic, it uses the word desert as the wording, the basis of this teaching. And here too, in our verse, it says they arrived in the desert of Sinai. So we can extrapolate the word desert from the word desert. Now, let's see what Tosfus is talking about. In a different piece of Talmud, where it's talking about when did, how long before a holiday are we obligated to start learning the laws? One says a month, brings a proof. Then there's an opinion that says two weeks. And he brings a proof when Moses was told by God to tell the Jewish people about the sacrifice of Passover. So if God told Moses two weeks before Passover to tell them that prepare yourself for Passover, we extrapolate from here that everyone is obligated to start studying the laws of a holiday two weeks before. Let's see what happens here. Rab Nachman Bar Yitzchak said, I'm quoting to you a piece of Talmud, the law is derived by means of a verbal analogy between the term desert written here concerning Moses teaching the laws of Passover and the term desert written previously. It is written here in the desert of Sinai and it is written there, and God spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first of the second month. Just as there, when it uses the word desert, Bamidbar, it's talking about Rosh Chodesh, the new month, the new moon, so too over here, with regard to the Passover laws, it is on the day of the new month. Now, the new moon. Now that Tosfis knows about that piece of Talmud that uses the word desert and desert to make the connection, he says, one second, in our verse about when they arrived at Mount Sinai, it also uses the word desert. So why do we need to extrapolate from the word this day, this day, rather than using a different wording that we already apply this principle to for the very same cause? That's Tosa's question. By the way, Tosa's answers just simply, the Talmud preferred doing this one instead of that one, to use this day instead of desert. He doesn't explain himself. Now, comes along the Rebbe of Blessed Memory, and he asks a simple question on Tosfus. Why would Tosfus rather use the word desert? By using the word this day, the Talmud is actually using the very word to define itself. It says this day. What does this day mean? If we're going to use the word desert, which is later in the verse, 
then the connection is desert. Desert, and apply that to a different part of the verse that says this day. Isn't it much better to use the actual word this day to define itself? That's the question that the Rebbe proposes here. Now, based on this question, the Rebbe explains that we are going to see how all these words, this, day, desert, Sinai, are integral with what the Jewish people had to prepare themselves and experience in order to receive the Torah. And this is where the Rebbe uses the Talmud, the Talmud and, the, and the Tosvos to jump into the mystical teachings of Kabbalah and Hasidus. And now, let's start the lecture. So, as you know, um, I always start the lecture with giving you a list of which mystical concepts we're going to talk about. And then I'll explain them one by one. And we'll wrap it up with the practicality of the modern day issue. Okay, so... People, just that you know, we're going to get intricate the different levels of spirituality, which is defined as different levels of humility. Just bear with me. Everything will fall beautifully in its place. Okay? So here we go. Number one, completion of self. Number two, Rosh Chodesh humility. Number three, desert humility. Number four, Sinai self-completion. Number five, we shall do and we shall hear. And then finally, the last concept, this day, desert, Sinai. And let the amazement of Hasidus begin. Okay, so the children of Israel, we learn out of these verses on a mystical level that they had to go to, through two preparations in order to receive the Torah. Now, what are those two preparations? So the first preparation we extrapolate from a Midrashic teaching. It's uh, found in the Medrash Rabbah, the Medrash Tanhuma, and I quote to you. It says, if it, is, it quotes God as saying, it isn't just that I should give my Torah to people with defects. Now, what is that Medrash talking about? They extrapolate from the words that the entire nation saw, and the entire nation heard, and the entire nation stood. And they ask a question, is it possible within 600,000 people, just men from 20 to, to 60, and then there's the rest, the women and the kids, and the seniors and the children, that there wasn't one blind, one deaf, one person who was lame and couldn't walk? Thus, we extrapolate that God healed everyone before he gave us the Torah. Now, upon this, the Medris says, that why did God do that? Because God said, it isn't just, it isn't proper that I should give my Torah to people that have defects. Simply meaning physical defects. Now, in Hasidus and in Kabbalah, we apply that to spiritual defects. Thus, we are taught that from when the Jews left Egypt, knowing that God told Moses, because Moses told them, the, that God told Moses at the burning bush that I am taking them out of the Egypt in, in order to bring them to this mountain so that they will serve me. Meaning that God took us out of Egypt in order that we should receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. Thus, in prep, they were preparing themselves in the counting of the Omer. Now, counting of the Omer doesn't apply because the, the whole laws of the wheat and the new crop what doesn't apply. Thus, they tell us that the spiritual definition of counting the Omer. What is the spiritual definition of counting the Omer? And what it is, is that we count 49 days. Because according to Kabbalah and Hasidut, the soul, each person, is made up of seven emotions. And each one of these seven emotions has within them seven characteristics. Thus, what we hear here is that from when they left Egypt, knowing that they were going to receive the Torah from God at Mount Sinai, they started counting in the sense of self-perfection, to go ahead and fix self, self-refinement. And thus, one of the preparations that the Jewish people had to go through in order to receive the Torah from God is self-completion through the work of self-refinement, attribute by attribute, emotion by emotion. That is one thing. 
That's why, on this level, another Kabbalistic twist here, that is why on Rosh Chodesh Sivan, they reached Mount Sinai. Because if you count it all, Rosh Chodesh Sivan was the 45th day of the self-rectification. That means that they already completely rectified six of their emotions and the first three, which are the primary characteristics of the seven emotion. Thus, they arrived at Mount Sinai for Rosh Chodesh, on Rosh Chodesh Sivan, prepared in self-completion to receive God's Torah. Now let's talk about the second preparation. And the title is Rosh Chodesh Humility. Now the secondary prerequisite preparation that the Jewish people needed to have is based on the opening verse of the delivery of the Ten Commandments. Let's see what that is. The opening verse is, God spoke all these words saying. Now, when it says in the Torah, lemor, saying, it means le emor, you should say. I'm telling you this, that you should say it to others. Thus, when God would tell Moses, and God, the verse says, and God spoke to Moses these words, saying, what it means is God's telling Moses, I'm telling you these words, that you should say it over to the children of Israel. Now, that interpretation is problematic with this verse. Because this verse, God wasn't talking to someone to tell over. God was talking to all the children of Israel at simultaneously. So God, there was no one that had to tell over the other person what God said. Take it a step further. Our sages tell us, they extrapolate from the verses, that every single soul of every single generation, including of those who become Jewish by choice through conversion, all the souls were there at Mount Sinai. Thus, we cannot even translate the word lay more, meaning tell it over to the next generation. Thus, our sages struggle why the word lay more saying here. And one of the answers that we're taught on a mystical level is that the word lay more is very powerful here. What it's telling us is that whenever you study the Torah, it should be with its humility, transparency, and reverence that this is not about your intellectual capacity. It is rather the word of God which is rolling off your tongue. And thus we have the verse by King David in Psalm chapter 119, verse 172, where it says, my tongue will proclaim your word. Thus, when we study Torah, we don't take and allow our ego, our drive of ownership, and this is my thoughts on the matter. Rather, all we search for is, what is God saying to us? God's word. Thus, when God said these words, and he said, God spoke all these words saying, God empowered us to connect with that level of humility and transparency that when we study Torah, it should be about God's words coming out of me and not my words, my thoughts. So the second preparation is that of humility. We have self-completion and we have humility to the point of self-negation of ego. Now, let's take this one step further. According to Kabbalah and Hasidut, this is why the Torah was given on the 50th day. Remember I shared with you they counted 49 days. On the 50th day, God gave us the Torah. Why? Kabbalah tells us that the 50th gateway represents the supernal crown. The definition of supernal crown in Kabbalah is absolute transparency. There is no identity of the vessel receiving because it's absolutely transparent to the light which is illuminating. Thus, because the experience of receiving the Torah was lay more to be able to have that transparency of the supernal crown when we study Torah, thus it was given on the 50th day. Okay. Now, the connection between Rosh Chodesh Sivan. Okay, so if it's all about humility, transparency why on Rosh Chodesh 
And the secret of Rosh Chodesh is, as I mentioned before, that it says Jacob and his offsprings are likened to the moon, and we set our calendar by the moon. What is Rosh Chodesh? The new moon is all about that tiny sliver of the new moon, which represents total self-nullification. It tells us that the moon has no light of its own. It's only reflecting a greater light. And thus it depends on how it's positioned. Thus that's the notion of the self-negation that all we are doing when we study Torah and we do mitzvot is to reflect God's word, God's light. Okay. Now, we're going to go on to the next concept. So we spoke about the two preparations, and these two concepts are going to play itself over and over. One, the necessity of self-completion through self-refinement. Two, total humility and transparency. Now, third concept, desert humility. Now, the Hebrew word for desert is midbar. Now, the word midbar can be mystically, it is mystically defined. There's different mystical interpretations. This one is, break it into two words. Mem, the letter mem, daber. Now, daber means to speak. Now, in Hebrew, the prefix mem is that time, it's one of the couple of prefixes which is used to show that we're talking about the root word that we're talking about in its littleness stage. Thus, me daber is talking about a littleness of daber. And what that mystically means is that when we speak the words of Torah, it has to be with me, littleness, self-negation, self-transparency, it shouldn't be about the strongness of I think and I and, and I might, I get this. Rather, God, please allow me to understand your wisdom. Allow your words to roll forth from my mouth. So that notion of midbar is also as explained by Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, when he uses a verse talking about the, the midbar, the desert which God took us out of Egypt into, he says, Eretz lo zarua, a land not sown. What that means on a mystical level is, sown means the human effort, my will, my intellect. The desert represents a barrenness of the human's involvement. And thus it remains nothing more than the recipient of God's word with an obedience driven by a transparency rather than the self-will and the self-intellect. So according to this, let's put the two together now. The word desert represents humility, which is the second preparation for receiving the Torah. Let's go now to the next concept. Sinai self-completion. The verse says, and on this day of the third month, they reached the desert of Sinai. What does the word Sinai mean? And what is it telling us in this theme? So for this, I'm going to take you to a piece of Talmud. The Talmud says, what, what is the reason it is called Mount Sinai? And there's different opinions. And this is, no, it can't be that because it should have been that, that, that. And then they come to this conclusion. It is because it is a mountain upon which hatred, Sinai, is very close to the Hebrew word sin'ah. Sin'ah means hatred. So listen to what the Talmud says. It is because it is a mountain upon which hatred for the nations of the world descended because they did not accept the Torah. Now, on a mystical level, Hasidus always gives us the beautiful insight here. And it says as follows. What is the nations of the world? Hatred came down, descended upon the nations of the world for not receiving the Torah, accepting the Torah. So Hasidus says deeper, nations of the world, it's all within the microscopic world. What it means is within me, I have a yetzahara. I have an evil inclination that doesn't want to accept the Torah. 
It doesn't want to subjugate itself to God's will. It wants to live in its will, its identity. And thus, the Talmud is teaching us, according to Kabbalah, according to Hasidut, that why is it called Sinai? Because they're descended from above a hatred towards the other side, the evil inclination within me. Now, what does that mean, a hatred? When I accepted the Torah, there descended a hatred to my animalistic side, my evil inclination. And to understand that, we're going to talk about a teaching in the Talmud of Sanhedrin, and it says this beautifully. It says, Rabbi Hanan said, why is the Torah called Toshia? Now, there's different definitions of the word Toshia that the Talmud wants to extrapolate there. But it brings a verse in which the Torah is called in Hebrew, Toshia. And his opinion is, because it weakens. The word Toshia, he connects to the word Matesha. It weakens the strength of a person who engages in its study. Why would that be? Torah is the book of life. Why would we say that it weakens the strength of the person studying the Torah? Mighty giants studied Torah. King David, King Solomon, these were warriors. Moses was a warrior. What does it say? It's weakened. So the mystical meaning is not that it weakens our body. It weakens our arrogance, our ego, our other side, our concept of evil inclination. Thus we see that the job of the Torah which given on Mount Sinai, sinna, hatred, what it really means is that God breaks within us that spirit of arrogance, of rebellion. Thus, again, we're talking about the self-completion preparation to receive the Torah through self-refinement, working down our emotions. It's not about the egocentric love. It's about the selfless love. It's not about the egocentric anxiety. It's about the awe. That's what it means when it says Sinai, breaking the arrogance of the other side. Now, according to this, as I said, while the desert, Midbar, represents humility, Sinai represents self-completion. Again, we have those two concepts playing over. Now we're going to go to the next step. And here it gets, it's, it's such a beautiful teaching of the Rebbe in just dissecting and then becoming so practical in what it means to be a spiritual person. At this point, we're going to explore the different dimensions of the self nullification in order to understand the coexistence of the dichotomy of this humility, transparency, and day. Identity, revelation, self-completion. This day, we're going to talk more about how those two words are a dichotomy when, when we finish explaining this. Now, and in order to do this, we're going to turn to an amazing teaching of our sages in the Talmud concerning what happened on the day before we received the Torah. So the Talmud goes through what happened on every single day. Rosh Chodesh, what did Moses do? They had to prepare themselves three days, and mikvah, and the whole nine yards. Then it says what happened on the fifth day of Sivan, the day before they actually heard God's voice. And it says that on that day, Moses asked the Jewish people, God told them, ask them if they're willing to accept it. And they answered, we will do and we will hear. Now, in the Talmud, and we're going to talk about this today, it's huge that they gave the precedence of we will do before over we will hear. Most people, uh, can you do me a favor? Uh, let me hear what you want. I don't say, yeah, I'll do it. What do you want? First, let me hear. Then let me do. Yet the Jews said, we will do and we will hear. So the Talmud tells us, I'm quoting to you the Talmud now, it says, Rabbi Simai taught, when Israel accorded precedence to the declaration we will do over the declaration we will hear, 600,000 ministering angels came and tied two crowns to each. And, and why, whoa, sorry here. Sorry about that. Every member of the Jewish people, one corresponding to we will do, and one corresponding to we will hear. 
Sounds like a beautiful piece of Talmud. However, the Talmud is self-conflicting. First, the Talmud says that the reason for the crown was specifically because of the Jewish people giving precedence to the we will do before the we will hear. Then it talks about, no, the two crowns are one for we will do and one for we will hear. Nothing to do with the precedence. So the beginning of the statement and the closing of the statement seems to be in conflict with each other. Is it only because of giving precedence? That fact maybe should only be one crown. Or is, no, it's not about the crown. It's just a mere answer. We will do one. We will stay here another two crowns. And therefore, what we're going to understand from this is that the reason why there's two crowns, let me say this in other words, the reason why we will hear earned a crown is only because it was presidented by we will do. And the reason why we will do earn the crown is only because it was followed by we will hear. And now let's understand this. Now, the, diff the difference between the declaration of we will do and of we will hear is the difference between, and I'm going to quote you a saying from the Talmud, and we're soon going to see it, there is the acceptance of the yoke of the kingdom in heaven, which means I have to accept the yoke of God. God is my king. And then we will hear is the acceptance of the yoke of the mitzvot, God's commandments. So there's two different acceptances here. There's accepting God as my king, and then there's accepting God's commandments. Let's see what the Talmud says about this. So the Talmud is in the tractic that talks about the mitzvah of saying Shema. Hear, O Israel, God is our God. God, God is one. We're supposed to say it every morning and every evening, and it's made up of two primary portions. There's a third portion, but we're going to talk about the two primary portions. Now let's see what it says. Rabbi Yeshua ben Karcha said, name of a sage, why? In the mitzvah of reciting the Shema, did the portion of Shema precede that of the Haya im Shemoah? So the name of the first portion is Shema. This name of the second portion is the Haya im Shemoah. And he answers, this is so that one will first accept upon himself the yoke of kingdom of heaven, which appears in the portion of Shema. Do that one first. And only then, after you accepted the yoke of God, the kingdom of heaven, then accept upon yourself the yoke of his commandments, which appears in the second paragraph. So the first paragraph talks about accepting God. The second paragraph talks about accepting God's commandments. First accept God and then accept his commandments. Okay. Now, that's the Talmud. Through understanding the mystical depths of these two portions and the precedence over the first in the first portion over the second portion, we will have keen insight to the we will do, we will hear, and the precedence of we will do over we will hear. Let's handle this. The two portions of Shema and Vahaya and Shemoa in Kabbalah are known as the two ver services of ebb and flow. Let's talk about what this means. What does it mean to ebb and to flow? Ebb is from below to above. I'm ebbing upwards to God. Flow is I am engaging in the physical world. Now, how does this work? So the portion of Shema, the acceptance of the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, in heaven, we are experiencing the ebb. And the simple reason is, just listen to the words. Hero Israel, God is our God, God is one. It talks about the oneness of God. And thus, when I become aware of the oneness of God, I want to leave my state of separation, egocentric, and I want to be, go up, yearn to be in the bosom of the oneness of God. So the first portion is about the ebb, from below to above. Now, the second Torah portion, which talks about the physical commandments that God is commanding us to do, that is talking about the flow. Coming back into the physical dimension of our environment and doing physical mitzvot, physical kosher food, 
physical giving charity, physical praying and putting on the phylacteries, physical lighting the Shabbos candles, okay? So we have the up and the down, acceptance of God, acceptance of his commandments. Now, let's go ahead and return to this concept now. Now, in order for our flow return into the physical that it should be spirituality without getting submerged in the egocentrism of our physical environment. You know, when I come back into this world, yeah, I have all the beautiful intentions of doing nothing more than serving God. And then I come across money. And then I come across power. And then I come across fame. And then I come across, you know, if I really study a lot of Torah and I become a very big rabbi, that's power, that's fame, and that's money. So in order to protect that the flow should not be tripping and emerging into the egocentrism of the physical world, we need that the flow should be preceded and imbued by the ebb. In other words, if the self-completion preparation, though we shall hear, is not preceded by the humility of self-negation preparation of the we shall do, then the self-compilation isn't spiritual and isn't deserving of a crown. Thus, the crown of the we shall hear, the crown of the self-completion in preparing myself to receive the Torah, it's only worthy of a crown if it's preceded by the we shall do, the total humility and self-negation before God. On a deeper level, mitzvot are the will of God. Why do I do this? Because God wants me to do it. He commanded me to do it. He wants me to do it. Now, the acceptance of the yoke of the mitzvot, we will hear, will do mitzvot, is the humility and the self-nullification of my will for God's will. I don't want to do this. God said, do it. So I will negate my will for God's will. So it's a relationship between my will and God's will. While the acceptance of the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, we will do. What does it mean when I say I accept you, God, as my God? What that actually means is that it's the complete, absolute humility and self nullification to the master of the will, in which my entire being and identity is that I am a servant and subject of God. And thus my entire self, essence, is nullified to the entire self of God. So when I accept God as my God in the Shema Yisrael, it's not about I accept that no matter what I want, I will always do what you want. Because that leaves me as me, but I'll do what you want. When I accept God as my king, before we even talk about his commandments, when I accept God as my king, I am accepting that I am but his subject and his servant. We're not talking about what I do and what I don't do. We're talking about who I am. Uh, let me go off script here and give an example. When the person signs up to the army, there's that moment when he's no more Joe Smith. He is now literally property of the USA. In the times of monarchy, when someone became a soldier, he was no more him. Killing a soldier is not murder of a civilian. It is murder of an object of the king. And thus there's a whole different set of laws here. The Shema Yisrael, the acceptance of God, is where I become, quote unquote, God's property now the aftermath after signing up to the army is that you have to take orders and you have to fulfill the orders and if you disobey there's entire rules and punishments that's the second step thus if i don't first accept that i am but a subject and a servant of god then my self-completion self-perfection is not spiritual it's not about God. It's about me. And I know that following the laws of the Torah 
is ultimate discipline, ultimately, ultimate being a mensch. So it's not about God, it's about me. Thus, the only time where we will hear the acceptance of the yoke of your commandments is spiritual is when it's preceded by we will do you are my god i am but your subject okay let's go further then nevertheless there is an unprecedented humility and self-negation to god which the we will hear gives to the we will do see until now we spoke about the importance of we will do being before presidents over we will hear so that the entire we will hear is driven by the total humility and self-negation of being the we will do i am your subject and therefore i will perfect myself as your subject i will do your mitzvot now we're going to talk about this is amazing we're going to talk about how only through the we will do being followed by we will hear is the we will do truly great. Let's say it in other words. Only through my accepting God's commandments is my accepting God spiritual. How do you figure? Let's see. Now, when I ebb, in other words, when I meditate and concentrate on the limitations, the finite egocentric separation and division and definition of creation and the world. And then I study and meditate about the oneness of God. And I want out. I don't want to live in the mundane egocentric voices in my head. I yearn to leave go, let go and let God. I yearn to be in the bosom of the oneness of God. At that stage, it's my yearning. It's about me. Yes, I want to give myself to God. I want to be nothing but the subject of God. But the first words in that sentence was, I want. Thus, even when I say, I want to stop being me and I want to belong to you, it's about self. I yearn not to be caught up in the rat race. I yearn to be spiritual and to be God's. And what I heard myself just saying is, I, 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 I yearn. Yeah, some people yearn fame and, and, and millions of dollars. And other people will yearn spirituality, yearn to stop being self and becoming God. But, but not becoming God, becoming one with God. What happens when I yearn and I'm having a spiritual moment and I really am dedicated to stop being egocentric, competitive, and me, 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 me. And I want nothing more but to be in the bosom of God. And then God tells me, oh, you want to be with me. Well, I want you, if you want to be with me, what I want is for you to help your neighbor. What I want is for you to carry my name and my benevolence and my compassion and my justice. I don't want you up here with me. I want you down dear. I want you tending to and caring for my world my human race, my creatures. What that means is that the humility and the self-negation here is that I don't even indulge in my spiritual yearning because ultimately it's not about me, it's about God. And God doesn't want me to be in heaven, spiritual angel. He wants me to be down here. He wants me to be a mensch. He wants me to help others. He wants me to do mitzvot. Thus, when the we will do, when the you are my God is followed and driven into, and therefore I will be all I can be and do what you want me to do, 
That's the spirituality of accepting God. Thus, the accepting God is what keeps the accepting His commandments spiritual, and accepting His commandments is what keeps my accepting God spiritual. That is the beauty of the relationship that what we're seeing here. And now we can close up the question that we had with Tosvot that we're going to explain now, and then we'll get practical. So, Tosvot's question I say I shared with you before. Tosvot presents a question. The question is, why do you have to extrapolate that it's Rosh Chodesh from the word this day, if in a different piece of Talmud, we extrapolated that this day means Rosh Chodesh from the word desert, desert, desert. Now we understand what Tosis is thinking. Tosis is saying we should embrace the absolute humility of the desert. Remember what I said about desert? The land that's not sown. There is no I want. There is no I understand. There is no I think. Rather, it's all about let the words of God roll off my tongue. Let me want nothing more than to open up and embrace the word of God. So Tosa is saying, stick to the desert word. It's much more beautiful here. The Talmud says, no, we're going to stick to the word this day. Because this day is even more humble and more spiritual than the word desert. How do you figure? Let's see. The word this is total humility. How do we know that? Because our sages tell us, Moses always prophesies with the word this. This is what God said. Other, prophet, other prophets, all the other prophets, only prophesied by the word ko, so. So is the word of God. Now, who is Moses and why did he use the word this? So we have a verse in the Torah that says, and I quote, Now this man Moses was exceedingly humble, more so than any person on the face of the earth. So we see the word this is connected with the most humble person in the entire world. Thus the word this means God is pointing and saying this. It's me, not you. It's me. It's my words of Torah. Now the word day in Jewish mysticism reflects not humility, but reflects self-perfection. How do you figure? Because the word day in Genesis, it says in God called light day. So day is light, light is revelation, and in Kabbalah, light is love. Now love is expansion, or is small. Light, love is expansion. Thus the word day is where I embrace my emotions that God gave me, my faculties, revelation, expansion. Now when you put together the word this and day, humility, and self, the self in the spiritual sense, the self-completion, the self-refinement, what we're having here is that the we will hear, remember, the doing should be only about the humility of the I accept God. And the I accept God should be driving, and therefore I will do what you want, God, and not what I want. Thus, the Talmud says, the desert is very humble. The desert is about total self-negation. But greater than that is, when it's not about total self-negation, it's about embracing self in the sense of total negation. It's not that I'm going to run away from self to belong to you, God. Rather, I will embrace self so that I can be a conduit for everything you want me to do. That is the ultimate definition of spirituality. And in closing, in closing, let us return to our open modern day issue of what is the greatest level of spirituality and how do I practically, or do I practically obtain it? It would seem that the greatest spirituality is that of seclusion and abstinence, submerging ourselves only in Torah study, prayer, self-rectification, with little to no engagement with the world issues, community issues, and the prattle of others. 
Yet this form of living is very conducive. Yes, this form of living is very conducive for becoming spiritual. However, it is the spirituality that the person, the ego, wants. And that's the spirituality that God wants from us. God wants us to care and to tend to his world, his creatures, and his human race. God wants us to care about community and about the needs of others. And being that spirituality is a binary code, where it's either about God or about ego, thus even spirituality can be everything but spirituality, because it's the spirituality that I want. And thus we're being told, no, spirituality is about God. God, what God wants, and God wants you to engage. Yes, it means I'm going to not be able to be so spiritual. And then, no, I have to let go of that and make it about what God wants me to do. And God wants me to engage. Thus, we need to put aside our own ebb and yearning to be alone with God and instead be humble enough to embrace the flow in creating a peaceful, blessed, and holy abode for God here on earth. Thank you, my dear friends.